Hello and welcome to video number eight. This is the last video in our chapter on hardware and communication. And we're going to talk about the World Wide Web, the internet, different types of network, client and server structures and peer-to-peer -peer networks, network protocols, handshaking and even protocol stacks. So with all that in mind, it's best that we get started. My first question to you is what is the difference between the World Wide Web and the internet? Students often get these two terms mixed up or they don't actually know what the World Wide Web is or what the internet is. If you have a look at this picture here, this is a diagrammatic representation of the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is a massive network of websites and all of these websites are somehow linked together. We use a web browser to access these different websites and we type in addresses that link us to the websites. So what about the internet? The best way to remember this is the internet is the physical part of the network. And this physical part provides the hardware medium for the World Wide Web to sit on and use. How did the internet and the World Wide Web actually come about? In the bottom right hand corner there, you will see a man laying the first transatlantic cable when we connected to America via a copper cable. This was used to send electrical signals down a wire over to our friends in America. But in 1989, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, in the bottom left-hand corner there, implemented the first successful communication between a hypertext transfer protocol client and a server via the internet in mid-November. That's enough history for one day. Now we're going to look at the way in which computers are connected to our networks. And they can be connected in two different ways, either a wired or a wireless communication link and you would have seen these before via ethernet cable or via your home router. Let me define what a computer network actually is. It's a collection which is two or more of interconnected computers that have the ability to communicate with each other and that will be worth one or two marks in an exam. Now I'm going to show you two different types of network and there are more types of network than this but I'm going to try my best to stick to the specification. The first type is a LAN, which stands for a local area network. The second type is a WAN, a wide area network. A local area network is a small network, usually your home network. We call it a LAN or sometimes a YLAN, a wireless local area network. And local refers to the computers being physically near each other in the same vicinity. The best example I can give you of a wide area network is the internet, as we can access web servers all over the world. It's called a WAN because the coverage of the network is over a large geographical area. So if you're trying to remember what the difference is between a LAN and a WAN, one is a very small geographical area and one is a very large geographical area. A local area network is more secure due to how local it is. A wide area network is more prone to a man-in-the-middle attack. This is when the communication is intercepted between two computers for malicious intent. So we've got different structures in our network. We have lots of different computers and we've got different hardware such as servers. But we're going to talk about the client server structure here. And when I say clients, what I mean is just the computers, even the ones that you use. And when I say servers, servers are basically a central resource that provide functionality to our clients. In a distributed system, computers work together by sharing services to make a complete system. And that's what distributed systems are all about. It's a model in which components located on networked computers communicate and coordinate their actions by passing messages. Everyone works together towards a common goal. The services such as file storage in the cloud are made available on servers. The clients connect to the servers to get access to these services. Key here is that the computing power is held at one central point on the server. The client's request and the server responds. And this is exactly what programs such as Microsoft Outlook actually do. When requesting services from the server, you will often get a security challenge such as a login. There are problems also associated with servers. If the server goes down for whatever reason, then none of the clients in the network can access any of the services on the server. Well, you might say to me, well, John, 
let's just remove the middleman. Well, there is actually a structure for that and we call it a peer-to-peer -peer network. Each computer or peer has the same status as everybody else and there's no servers controlling services here. Now you may have seen some of these common uses before. The main use of peer-to-peer -peer networks is file sharing. Now not all file sharing is bad even though it has a bad reputation for illegal downloading but I know you don't do that. To file share, a file is requested by a number of peers. The peers download the program in parts. Each peer downloads a part of the file and we call this leeching. And this is done until the peer has enough of the data to share. As soon as the peer has the whole file, the peer then becomes a seed and other peers then leech from that seed. And this will continue until that computer is out of the network. Now I'm going to tell you exactly what I tell my class. If you can master protocols and it comes up on the exam, you are laughing. Now there you can see a screenshot of the definition of what a protocol is. And we're really looking at number four, a set of rules governing the exchange or transmission of data between devices. Now with protocols, we specify data formats, we standardize communication, and even looking at some examples we're talking about linking computers to printers, mobile phones to Bluetooth, using our protocols, FTP, HTTP, SMTP, or even POP3 to transfer data. It's standardizing the transmission between two devices, making sure that everybody is on the same page. And if we didn't do this, it would be absolute chaos. It's like taking somebody that can speak Russian and putting them in a room with someone that can speak English. If they speak two different languages, it's not going to work. So let's get started on our protocols. And these are directly from the exam board. So I'm going to show you where you get your marks for just putting these in the exam. So the first one, if you're given FTP, always tell me what that means. File transfer protocol. That's where you're going to get your first exam mark from. So FTP allows for the transfer of large files over a network and it's important that you put large files and that's where you're going to get your second mark from. And this is important as FTP protocol has built in error checking and retransmission requests as necessary. And that's usually a checksum or a parity bit. We'll talk more about that later. So the next one is HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Sometimes you'll see this with HTTPS, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. Now, HTTP allows the transfer of multimedia web pages over the internet, and that will get you one mark. And HTTP allows different web browsers to display and format the web pages as the original author intended. It doesn't matter if you're using Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, I don't know why you would. But there you go, it displays it exactly how the author intended. Okay, SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, allows emails to be sent over a network. SMTP provides a standard way of transferring emails between two different servers. And that's important as Internet Message Access Protocol or IMAP allows emails to be transferred between computer systems, but this time via the Internet and that'll get you one mark. With IMAP, the messages are stored on the server instead of the client's machine, and this is exactly what happens with the emails on your phone. And this obviously saves storage space. Dynamic Host Control Protocol, or DHCP, this is the very important protocol that assigns IP addresses to devices on a network. DHCP ensures that unique or dynamic IP addresses are allocated and allows addresses that are no longer being used to be returned to the pool of available IP addresses so that we can reissue them out as and when we need to. Universal Datagram Protocol or UDP sends datagrams across a network. What on earth is a datagram? Datagrams are a little bit of a rogue. They use a connectionless communication service, which basically means that the delivery time, the arrival time, and the order of arrival of datagrams is not really guaranteed by the network, so they just turn up when they like. 
and because they arrive whenever they like, they come with very few error recovery services. And this is because during video and audio streaming, the protocols are designed to handle occasional lost packets. They need to receive new packets rather than waiting on the retransmission of previous packets that have already been sent. And you'll be pleased to know people that this is the last protocol that we need to look at. And it's the transmission control protocol slash internet protocol. And it allows any networked computer to communicate with each other. And as you can probably imagine, that is pretty important. TCP IP specifies how signals are routed and transported around the network. Hopefully you can see how I got three marks for each of those protocols. Key tips here are to fully explain what the protocol does and also define the acronym of the protocols for a mark. Moving on now to something that was a little bit cheeky from the exam board. This is handshaking and this was a four mark question that was on the 2017 paper. Describe the process of handshaking between two devices for four marks. Now that to me sounds very ambiguous, but let's have a look at it. First, we need to know what is handshaking. Handshaking is the process by which two devices establish their readiness to communicate. And that's usually worth one mark, that question. You're going to see some strange acronyms now. SYN or SYN is used to indicate the start of a TCP session. And we know that stands for Transmission Control Protocol. ACK is an acknowledgement that the TCP header is acknowledging data. So what happens during handshaking is device 1 will send an SYN or a SYN to device 2. It's basically saying, hey, do you want to talk? Device 2 will then acknowledge the signal. So that's why we send a SYN ACK back. And it's basically saying, hey, yes, I do want to talk, but do you also want to talk with me? Device 1 then sends another signal of acknowledgement. Basically saying, yeah, I'm happy with that. And then device one can begin transmission. And that is handshaking. Don't forget, the definition of it is the process by which two devices establish their readiness to communicate. Don't worry, we're nearly there now, people. Hang in there for the last couple of minutes. So now we've got protocol stacks. And this is how we send packets over a network. And the questions we've got to ask ourselves when sending anything over a network is one, how will it get there? Two, how will the packets be formatted? Three, does the packet need to arrive in a specific order? And what happens when an error is introduced during transmission? Well, we have a stack of protocols to deal with these questions. And we have four key layers that each have protocols on them. Now I encourage my students to come up with an acronym for remembering these four layers. So someone in my class come up with all trees need daylight. Something as simple as that, if it works for you, crack on. So let's explain each of these layers. The first layer is the application layer. Programs such as the web browser interacts with this layer. We've got protocols such as HTTP and SMTP, and this is where the data starts its journey. Moving down to the transport layer, the protocols contained on the transport layer are the transmission control protocol and the user datagram protocol. The application layer talks to the transport layer through a port, and it's usually port 80 because we're talking to the web browser. TCP chops the data into packets. A header is put on the packet, and this includes the packet's order number. If we had 10 packets, this packet might be packet number four. Error checking is also included here. This might take the form of a checksum or a parity bit. The packets are then pushed onto the network layer. Here, the IP or internet protocol attaches two things, the origin address and the destination address, because we need to know where we've come from in case we need to resend anything, and we need to know where we're going to. The final layer is the hardware layer and you need to think physical here because it handles MAC addresses so the data goes to the correct physical machine. Every machine comes with a specific unique MAC address 
so it knows exactly where it's going to. Also, the data packets are then converted into electrical or light impulses to be sent down the cables. I've mentioned data packets quite a bit, but what is actually contained inside of one of those data packets? Because we know that data is split up into these packets, but what's actually inside them? Oh, well, we've got the sender's IP address, we've got the intended receiver's IP address because we need to know where it's coming from and where it's going to. Also, how many packets the data has been broken into and which is the specific number of this packet. Finally, we've got our error checking, our parity bits or our checksum. So now let's have a look at the advantages of using protocol stacks. We've got separation of the logic. So problems in a single protocol can be dealt with in isolation. Protocols at different parts of the stack can be swapped out. And you've got more flexibility when choosing what properties you want your network to have. So whoever sets up the network can choose what protocols set up in the stack. And that is everything we need to know for our network topic. That is also the end of our hardware and communication chapter. During your revision, you need to go back over the eight videos, add to your notes and watch them as many times as you need to. Our next chapter is logical operations and I do hope you can join me for another video. I've been John and the final thing for me to do is to thank you for watching.